Hello and welcome to Somerville Community Access Television and our continuing coverage of election 2016. No, not that election, our local state elections. As many of you know, the presidential election season is well underway and so are the elections for representatives on Beacon Hill in the Massachusetts legislature. As part of the mission of all community access television stations and media centers to keep the public informed about our elected officials and government, we are pleased to bring to you the candidates for the second Middlesex Senate District, which includes Medford, Somerville, parts of Winchester, and Cambridge. The Democratic Party candidates for the second Middlesex Senate District are incumbent State Senator Patricia Jalen and Cambridge City Councilor Leylan Chung. Stay tuned and check your local listings for when this program will air on your local community access station throughout this election season. For SCAT TV, I'm Joe Lynch, and as always, stay safe, stay informed, and please don't forget to vote. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this candidate profile of Leland Chung, a current Cambridge City Councilor and candidate for the second Middlesex Senate District in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The second Middlesex District includes Medford, Somerville, Winchester, and Cambridge. Council Councilor Chung was first elected to the Cambridge City Council in 2010 and ran for Lieutenant Governor in 2015. A native of Cambridge and an entrepreneur by profession, he and his family make their home in Cambridge. He has focused this campaign on the issues of transportation, including the Green Line Extension, housing, jobs, the environment, education, and entrepreneur and innovation. Councilor Chung will face incumbent State Senator Patricia Jalen of Somerville in the September 8th primary. It is my pleasure to welcome to this program Cambridge City Councilor and candidate for the State Senate, Leland Chung. That is a mouthful for me to <laughs> introduce you. How are you doing, Leland? I'm good. How are you? Good, 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 good. The summer is fast approaching. It's beautiful weather. It's beautiful weather, and you are smack dab in the middle of the campaign. I, I take most of what I say about candidates in the introduction directly from your website, but I always give the candidates a little bit more time. Tell us a little bit more, anything you want to say, Leland. Well, as you said, I have a, a beautiful wife and a beautiful daughter. and we're, you know, My wife and I decided to raise our daughter uh, here, I think, for all the same reasons that you and others uh, love living here. You know, we love the access to the services, the arts, the culture, uh, the fact that all around us, people are literally inventing the future. But there's also this, fat, this great connection to history. As you walk down the street, you can, you can literally feel it all around you. Uh, back to before the founding of the country, when you know, we were a group of people and pioneers uh, working and trying to make a better life for our children. And you know, back then, I think government was a bit simpler. You know, it was a bit, Cambridge uh, started around a farmer's market. Somerville uh, was a trade route that uh, led the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it was people coming together in town halls that they built by their own hands deciding how to pool their resources and, and spend them to the benefit of the community. Somehow along the way with, you know, like super delegates and super Tuesdays and super PACs, democracy kind of got to get a bit complicated. And I've seen this on the Cambridge City Council and as I've been canvassing and knocking doors in my race for state Senate that, you know, we've governments along the way got a bit too complicated, you know, and there's, and, and there's been a, a, a loss of faith in, in the things that we can do together by people. And, you know, when I knocked on the door of, of other parents who are in the same struggles that my wife and I are in, trying to figure out what do we do with our daughter, because we're both working parents. And they talk about, you know, the 9 a.m. drop off, the 1 p.m. pickup, the $30,000 a year. And I, I hear the frustration of people trying to make ends meet only to realize that it's, an un, it's impossible, it's unsolvable. You know, and I, I knock on another door and I hear a story about you know, one person works at you know, Google, a person works at some biotech, and they can't afford to buy anywhere. And they're, you know, I hear their, their, you know, their desperation that, you know, if they can't do it, who possibly can? And then I talk to their neighbor, and, you know, it's, you know, an older gentleman who talks about how, you know, he grew up in this house and, and has seen all of his friends move away and, you know, rents skyrocket and is wondering, you know, do I sell my house to pay for college for my grandkids or do I try to hang on and preserve the community that, that I know and love? And I hear, you know, again, this loss of, of, of faith that, you know, all of a sudden a lifetime of hard, honest work is, is, less, is worth less than the place that they got to store all their stuff in. And, 
you know, we've done some amazing things as a commonwealth. You know, we built the first school, the first library, the first subway. You know, projects used to seem a lot easier, but somehow now they're so hard. And with all the innovation happening, with all the companies coming in, with the growth that we're experiencing, that pressure is just is hitting families uh, from all sides. And I worry that we've spent so much time looking up that we've forgotten about the people climbing the ladder behind us. And are you seeing, Leland, are you seeing that, the voters expressing that to you, not just Somerville, Cambridge, but uh, Medford and Winchester, you know, is that a general sense all over, even in, you know, communities that may be slightly wealthier or have slightly higher median income levels? Is that right across the board? It's amazing. I'll be at a school in Winchester at a community meeting or a church basement in Medford or, you know, at a, um, you know, a startup incubator here in Somerville. And I'll have this sense of deja vu, like I've forgotten where I am because I'm hearing the exact same stories that I hear as a Cambridge City Councilor when I go to community meetings. And that makes me think that, you know, these issues aren't city by city. And what I've learned in the council is that no city alone can solve the problems we're facing because the housing market is regional. The jobs we're bringing in, it's a, we have a regional economy. And all of us uh, are facing the same problems and the same challenges. And you know, Beacon Hill, uh, you know, we, we used to be known as, as a beacon of hope, right, to, to people who were trying to advance civil rights and expand, uh, you know, access and, and uh, put everyone on the same footing. We used to be a beacon of freedom. You know, we have so many students that cycle through here and they'd, they would come and learn, but also pick up our values and bring them back to their own, their, their, you know, to their homes. But now Beacon Hill sits atop the greatest income inequality in the country. We have the largest achievement gap. And in the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest states in the country, if we can't solve the problems that, are, that people are going to bed, a, bed at night worrying about, I don't know who possibly can. We're talking about education. If you want to touch on, there seems to be um, you are facing you know, one of the incumbents in September. And there seems to be some slight difference in your opinion on charter schools and p versus public schools, or I hate to make it a them or us, but if you want to expand just a little bit more on the education and the charter school, public school issue. So this is what I hate about, about this, is that in that question, you never said kids. Right. You know? So I think the, the, the center and I share, share the same values in terms of wanting to give every single student access to a great education that's going to allow them to achieve whatever they want to achieve in life. But as soon as we frame the debate in terms of the structure and the schools, we're losing sight of what they're there for in the first place, which is, is the kids and the individual learning. And I'm, I'm, you know, I know that uh, Senator Jalen um, you know, was on the group of Gang of Four that was supposed to come together and help us avoid a referendum in November. Now we're going to have a referendum. That failed. And having ballot initiatives is the worst way to make policy. You're talking about lifting the cap. Lifting the cap. Yep. You know? And the hyperbole on both sides is, is astounding. But, you know, I went to a public school. I graduated from high school. My, my wife went to public schools. When we were making the choice for our daughter, we decided to send her to the Cambridge Public Schools. And I don't begrudge the senator for making her choice to send her kids to opt out of the public school system. But I do begrudge her trying to make that choice for all the other parents and trying to remove the choice from other parents to, that just want that hope that they can provide their kids with, uh, with a great education that's going to give them a leg up in life. And, and, I'll, and I'll just say, you know, that choice, it's easy, it's easy for me. You know, if, if, if we had a, a, you know, a school system that we didn't like, my wife and I could move, we could, we could, you know, we could spend, we could try to allocate some of our money towards private school, we, could, we have options. But so many people in our community have no options. Mm -hmm. They can't move. They don't have family that can take care of their kids. They don't have any choices in life, and, and those lack of choices hits the most economically depressed about us harder than anyone. So Leland, if you're successful in uh, come September, how would you frame that? You know, I mean, I, I understand what you said. It's about the kids first and foremost. It's not about unions. It's not about us versus them. It's about the kids and the best education. If you're successful and you're in the Senate come uh, January, how would, you, how would you move ahead with that issue? So I want to invest in transportation. I want to invest in our communities. I want to invest uh, in job training. but. Most importantly, I want to invest in education. And we are just now back to 2009 levels of funding for our schools. You know, and the, and the legislature talks about, you know, charter schools pulling money out of the schools. Well, the fund that was set up to reimburse public schools for kids that left for charter schools has been underfunded for the last five years. All right, we need to fund our schools adequately if we want them to achieve everything that we want to achieve. And education 
is the cornerstone of, of civilization, of our democratic, democratic society. We need to invest in universal pre-K. We, we need to make post-secondary education for our, to our state schools more affordable like it used to be. We need to have community colleges that prepare kids, prepare young adults for jobs, uh, to prepare them to get out into the workforce and make a living. We need to introduce computer science and, and science, engineering, and math into our high school so that, you know, when we, I, I really hate, I, you know, when we, we're attracting all these companies, and I hear a lot of people are saying, well, how do we keep more of the, the college students who come to school here, here? I think the question is backwards. I think we should be educating our kids to the point where, you know, we can build our own workforce. When you move a company here, you already have the talent that's, that's grown up here and lived here that can satisfy all of your needs to compete in a global economy. I want to make sure that our kids can are, have the training and the jobs so that they're not being displaced, but that they're competing in the jobs that, that we're bringing here. You know, it always fascinates me before the show we were talking about you know, the number of grandnieces and nephews I have, and now some of the older ones are going into college, and it fascinates me that they're leaving this area to go to schools someplace else, and it always comes down to the Benjamins, <laughs> always comes down to the money. But let me, let's move on to one more issue that seems to be a central issue here, and which is public transportation. Public transportation is going to affect three of the communities that you are striving to represent in the Senate, that being Cambridge with the relocation of, of uh, Leachmere, the extension of the Green Line into Somerville and Medford. Talk a little bit, if you can, um, just about your public transportation policies. Yeah, so it's, it's, this is one of those things that again goes back to that income inequality that we're facing as a region. You know, we should have done this 25 years ago when we first started talking about it. We should have done it 12 years ago when we started talking about it again. We should have done it after the reception when it was a, a shovel-ready project. And it's great that the senator says that she's been working on this for 25 years. Well, we've been waiting for 25 years. And the legislature still cannot tell you how much the Green Line extension is going to wind up costing. But there's been no calls to reform the bidding process. There's been uh, no one has said, well, you know what? If you fleeced us on the big dig, maybe you shouldn't be one of the contractors on the Green Line extension. There's been no calls for legislative oversight of the MBTA. There's been no one saying, you know what? If we're going to write you a $100 million check, we want to know how you're spending that money. In Cambridge, we know that. If we have a big contract, we know, OK, you're spending X on wood. You're marking up 10%. That's in line with market. We need that kind of transparency. We need to apply the open checkbook that the state has to our major contractors. So we need to invest in, in the green, we need to invest in transportation. But what's complicating it is, we have this massive housing crunch that is, uh, the green line is exacerbating. And then coupled with that, we have developers from Chicago coming in, kicking people out of their homes in anticipation of the green line being built. You know, if we, if we had done this earlier and we'd grown up around it, we wouldn't have these massive kind of disproportionate effects. But for some reason, now it is. And, and I'll also tell you, you know, 25 years to go six miles, I, I, you know, I often wonder, how do we ever do these things in the first place? You know, it seemed like a long time ago, it was so much simpler. We, we, you know, we're building the first subway, making these massive investments in infrastructure. I'm not trying to lead you down the path, but you know, when the original <laughs> public transportation systems were built, they were built with private enterprise, not yeah. government. Leland Chung, I told you this, uh, the interview was gonna go fast. The website where people can read more about your campaign for the Senate. So Leland Chung, L-E-L-A-N-D, last name is tricky, C H E U ng at uh, dot com. People can email me at leland at lelandchung.com. My, I've prided myself the entire time I've been on the council. My pub, my personal cell phone number has been publicly available. That's 617-444-9080. If people want to learn more, they're always free to call me. Just please don't give it to telemarketers because I've got enough of those calls already. <laughs> <laughs> Leland Chung, best wishes on September 8th in the primary for the state senate race. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been Joe Lynch for this political special 2016. See you next time. Hello and welcome to this candidate profile of Patricia Jalen, the incumbent state senator from the second Middlesex Senate District in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Senator Jalen was first elected to the state Senate in a special election in 2005. The second Middlesex district includes Medford, Somerville, parts of Winchester, and parts of Cambridge. A native of Texas, a former City of Somerville School Committee member, a former state representative for Somerville, and longtime resident, she and her family make their home in the Union Square District of Somerville. On Beacon Hill, she is the Assistant Vice Chair of the Senate Committee on Ways and Means, the Senate Chair of the Committee for Elder Affairs, Vice Chair of the Committee on Education and Chair of the Special Committee on Innovation and Alternative Education, as well as serving on committees of housing and judiciary. She will face Democratic challenger 
Cambridge City Councilor Lee Lin Chung in the September 8th primary. It is my pleasure to welcome to this program Senator Pat Jalen. Thank you. Welcome back, but you need no welcome to Union Square. Uh, it is your neighborhood. It is. It is. You have had one busy summer so far. Budget is still ongoing. You uh, go from one end of the day to the other, either performing your current job or campaigning. Pretty much. So I'm going to let you take it from here. You have uh, lots of things to talk about. What are the voters saying this election cycle? Well, let me just start, because I think not everybody in the district knows me yet, especially in Cambridge, where I have only been their senator for three and a half years. So I wanted to say that, and I also I think people would like to know how I approach my job. And so my first job was as a community organizer. I never thought that I was going to be a state senator. I never thought I was going to run for public office. But I wanted to change the world, and so I, I became a community organizer with migrant farm workers, and I learned so much about poverty that I became convinced that the issue of income inequality is the biggest one we face as a country. And I became convinced that people working together could make a difference. So I still think of myself that way. I still think of myself as an organizer. So everything I do um, has its roots in the community. And um, I'm going to give a couple of examples. The biggest change that I've seen in my period of time in the legislature, the biggest social change I've seen has been the movement for equal marriage and now for public accommodations. And both of those things happened in an historic sense relatively fast. And they happened because thousands of people came out of the closet, told their stories, and organized. And that was very exciting. That has been a very exciting process to be part of. But I would never put my name on anything that I do. I do things with peop other people. So for example, a smaller uh, thing that may be a victory this year is the Equal Pay for Equal Work bill, sure. yep. which I filed originally with Representative Alice Wolf from Cambridge. Um, because we believe that people should who do essentially the same work, same effort, same skill, should be paid equivalently regardless of their gender. So we've worked on it for several years. This year, we have enough support, not only in the women's groups, but among in the business community, in the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, for example, that we were able to pass it in the Senate, and we expect the House to follow suit. So those are, are just two examples. Right now, um, there's a lot. One thing I'm very interested in is the movement for uh, Fight for 15, so mm -hmm. that everybody that works in big box stores, in retail, in um, in fast food, in nursing homes, in daycare, uh, that all everybody who works should be able to earn enough to live. Now, $15 an hour is not really enough to live in Somerville, Cambridge. Medford or Winchester. We know that only too well these days. But it's better than $9 an hour. Mm -hmm. And so that is a very important thing. A couple of years ago, that, didn't, that seemed like pie in the sky. But now with that organizing going on, nursing homes in the, this year's budget, nursing home workers will be guaranteed $15 an hour. And, and that dovetails, Senator, right into a lot of the things that you've worked on ever since you were a state rep, which is elder affairs, protection of the elderly, mm -hmm. equal pay, mm -hmm. women's, women's issues, LGBT issues. You haven't stopped working on those. So it must be a little satisfying to see some of this legislation finally passing. It is, it is satisfying, but only briefly, because there's so much more to do. There's always another thing to <laughs> there's, accomplish. There's, I have, have this little sort of to-do list. And every time, every time something comes on, 12 more things go on. We're so in the middle of the budgetary session, though. You, uh, you, uh, and I know many of the state reps and the senators are up there working diligently. W what, at what point are you going to start making the cuts, though? The problem is that w both the House and the Senate passed their budgets based on a revenue projection that we made in January. Both of them are austerity budgets. Both of them, neither of them, meets our constitutional obligation to equal education for everybody. Neither of them gives home care the increases that 
they're, they need to keep them from being turnover and exhausted um, people doing, doing home care. Um, those are just two, two little examples. What happened in the revenue projected so, but revenue since, stream? Since we both passed that, first the, re the revenue projections were said to go down between 450 and 750 million dollars. That's a lot. And then this week we heard that based on Brexit, we may have as much as a billion dollars to cut out of both budgets. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be, this is more than austerity. This is deep, deep cuts. And you know, it's funny, I mean, the, the Brexit thing with, with um, Great Britain pulling out of the European Union, people have a tendency to say, well, that happened over there, mm. and don't understand the financial implications and the ripple effect that it will have, even to the point of a state budget. We're very dependent on uh, capital gains taxes. If, and so when capital gains go down because people's profits go down, then our revenues go down. It's all interconnected. We're it all is. dependent on financially on each it other. Is. Let's go into um, speaking about another billion dollar effort, which was the uh, extension of the Green Line. You've been a, a fierce advocate for transportation, public safety. Um, transportation, what's the update from Beacon Hill on the Green Line extension coming into Cambridge, Somerville, Medford? Well, it's in Cambridge, and we want it to get into Somerville. The Leachmere, the transfer of Leachmere. That's right. And, yeah. So we're waiting for the administration to come back to us and say how they are going to meet their self-imposed cap on spending for the Green Line extension. Uh, we are still hoping to persuade them uh, that there is a way to build the community path within their budget. So, and we know that this, this piece of the action will not include going to Route 16, but we will keep working on that because a lot of the value of the Green Line extension is there. But this, that's another example of how um, that is leadership by hundreds of people in Somerville and Medford particularly, um, by the city, city leaders, by the legislative delegation, um, by our congressman, Michael Capuano, who got us a billion dollars in federal funding. Uh, all of that was dependent on all those people working together. Tremendous amounts of community leadership, people showing up to meeting after meet, hundreds, hundreds of meetings. I, I was supposed to be impartial in this, but you, you and I first met at a meeting in 2003. <laughs> I didn't know that. <clears throat> That's when we first met, talking okay. about the Green Line. Let's, um, let's move into the educational realm for a little bit. You know, as the pie shrinks, the revenue pie shrinks a little bit, education, it appears, always gets hurt. Um, there is some uh, controversy, I would say, not really controversy, but there is some disagreement between you and your opponent over charter schools. We're beginning to learn. We don't know exactly what he thinks. Well, I leave it to you to talk about what your position is. Well, the question that's before the voters this fall is to lift, really, to eliminate the cap on spending on charter schools, on the money that comes out of local school budgets that goes to charter schools. So it means that local communities would no longer have control over their school budget. And it means that um, actually what, it also means there's an unlimited amount of money from the state budget that can go to charter schools because we've promised to um, help communities make that transition. We're not keeping that promise, but let me just give two examples of why it's important to have local control. In Somerville, there was a proposal for a new charter school. We already have the Prospect Hill Academy, but there was a proposal for a new one, which was attractive to many people. But as people in the community learned about it, they realized that if it fulfilled its mission and got enough children to go there, the school department would have to eliminate another school because they would have to cut that much out of their budget. Mm -hmm. And they looked around and the only school that would be the appropriate size would be the most popular school in the city, the smallest school, the Brown School. The Brown School, and right on the cusp of uh, Ward 5, Ward 6. And that built so much community opposition. But the Board of Education said that didn't matter. 
they do not consider the effect on other children or other people's choices. They only consider the quality of the proposal. But fortunately, we found something wrong with their proposal according to law, and they did not get that. But Brockton, internationally recognized as a, as a high school that has made enormous stri uh, strides, sure. was granted a charter over the objection of every elected official there. How many, th th are there any charter schools in, uh, I hate to say it this way, in the wealthier Many city. fewer, many fewer. Many fewer, so Winchester, for example, in your Senate There's district. There's one child in one Winchester, as far as I know. One charter school. One child. One child goes to in a charter, a charter school. Mm -hmm. Medford, any charter schools there? Yes, okay. Mystic Valley. Somerville, we know ha we have our and charter And kids schools. go from other communities to right. those charters. Right. You're gonna face an enormous, enormous amount of work. Um, I told you our 13 minutes, our 14 minutes goes fast. Ooh. Not the last time we will see each other this election season. And, um, oh, that's true. We, yeah, we will be announcing um, candidate debates in conjunction with our friends over at Cambridge Television. So I want to wish you the best in the primary coming up on Thursday, September 8th. Nobody's expecting it, but there, there it will go. be. It will be before we know it. Senator Pat Jalen, thanks for coming back to SCAT TV. Thank you. Thank we'll you for you this soon. opportunity. Thank you very much. For Somerville Community Access Television, once again, I'm Joe Lynch. As always, stay safe. Stay informed and please remember to vote.